Welcome to today's lesson. Um, our topic of choice is going to be how volunteerism helped the American cause during the revolution. How our country was shaped by volunteers. So the first series of volunteers I want to talk about came from the country of France. So early in the war, our Continental Congress were they were very aware of the lack of skilled soldiers within the Continental Army so they sent Ben Franklin to go to France to be a diplomat and one of his missions over there in addition to trying to procure aid from um, the King of France and to send supplies but one of his primary early missions was to uh, recruit French aid so, so military officers were able to come over and volunteer. So not just lower level soldiers, but we're talking generals and lieutenants and colonels that were high ranking within their military that came over and volunteered. So without being paid, they came to try and help support the Patriots' cause for independence. One specific officer, his name was Marquis de Lafayette, and he actually served as a major general directly under George Washington in the Continental Army. Another volunteer and a group of volunteers were Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys. Now the Green Mountain Boys, that was a group of militia men that, was, that were led by Ethan Allen. The group was based in what's today the state of Vermont. And once the revolution started in 1775, the Green Mountain Boys marched north to attack and they later captured the British fort called Fort Ticonderoga, just like the pencils we have today. This was one of America's first victories in the war. And then Ethan Allen, he was the leader of the attack, and he had about 83 militiamen with him. And he also kind of tag-teamed with Colonel Benedict Arnold, so he was uh, um, in the Continental Army, Arnold was. And this proved to be very beneficial to our war effort because Britain controlled that part of Canada and it helped protect the northern parts of America so that the British would not be able to invade south through Canada. So another major role that volunteers had in the war. Next we come to a guy named Nathan Hale. He was a spy. George Washington came to him and a group of others and requested a volunteer for a very dangerous mission. The mission required a volunteer to go behind enemy lines and spy on British movements. So Hale volunteered and he's known as one of the first American spies. So when he went behind enemy lines he disguised himself as a Dutch school teacher. He himself was a very smart guy as he was a graduate from Yale University and he successfully gathered information about the British troops and their their movements. Uh, Unfortunately, he was eventually captured when he attempted to re-enter American territory. And as he was recaptured, he was actually carrying documents with him that, that proved his guilt. So they were incriminating documents that he was carrying. So he was sentenced to be executed the following day. And legend has it that Hale said, I only regret that I have but one life to give to my country. So very famous words, legend has it. And then finally, the last group of uh, volunteers that we want to talk about are these militia groups. Now, militias weren't just formed prior to the American Revolution. They are as old as the colonies themselves. That during the colonial eras, era, um, these militias were called on to defend the colonies against Native American attacks. But they had a major role in fighting the British, especially during the battles of Lexington and Concord, so right after Revere and company rode through the night to warn that the Redcoats were coming, or more specifically that the Regulars were out. And although militias, they kind of had a, a bad reputation amongst the Continental Army because um, they weren't as disciplined, because they were these volunteer soldiers, they weren't um, a paid professional army. So while they could not go one-on-one -on -one against one of these professional armies, especially the British who were considered the strongest in the world, they were useful in a variety of other tactics. So they were good at suppressing loyalists. So remember loyalists are those that supported Great Britain. Um, they prevented slave uprisings and they became potential recruits for the Continental Army. A common question 
here at James Townsend and Son is how does a typical Revolutionary War militia soldier dress? So today I thought we would uh, dress Josh up in a standard uh, militiaman's outfit so you can get an idea about exactly what a uh, very generic uh, militia soldier would need to wear. So uh, from top to bottom, this under layer on Josh here, we've got a uh, black linen neck stock. Uh, in the time period, most soldiers would have either a, a, a black leather neck stock or a hair neck stock or something like that. Uh, our black linen neck stocks do a good job of emulating that, and they're also much more comfortable than a, le a, a leather neck stock. Uh, we've got a standard uh, 18th century work shirt on him. This is uh, the white muslin shirt. Uh, the white muslin shirts are probably the coolest and they're also the most versatile of our shirts. Uh, you could get a linen shirt or an Osnaberg shirt or even a check shirt and those all might work but the uh, standard white shirt is uh, works for um, anybody uh, civilian or military so it's a good starter shirt. Uh, then we have uh, Josh here in uh, trousers. Uh, both the knee breeches or the trousers would be correct for a militia person. Knee breeches possibly a little more proper for early war and trousers a little more um, proper or a little more um, common in uh, later wartime period. And we've got him in uh, the straight lasted shoes with uh, buckles. So this is our first layer. Now we're going to put a waistcoat on him. For a waistcoat we want a standard uh, 1770s waistcoat. This is a uh, a nutmeg colored canvas while other uh, waistcoats would be fine either wool or the cotton ones uh, especially for a militia person who's really just a civilian clothing uh, any of these things would work uh, if you want to get something that's possibly a little bit more versatile a white linen or a white uh, a white canvas one now that we've got the waistcoat let's put the outer layer on first the hat we've got a round hat on him which is very common uh, hat. We could have him also in a, a regular tricorn hat also. And we have him in a hunting frock. Very common for uh, militia soldiers to be using a hunting frock. Sometimes uh, even recruits that just come in and before they're issued their regimental, uh, they would have something like a hunting frock. Uh, so that's very common. This one's a white linen one. We also have uh, canvas ones either in white or in uh, different colors. But uh, the white linen one's uh, a perfect uh, kind of fabric for this so I chose that to put on him. We're almost done. All we need now are accoutrements. Every soldier needs a haversack, something to carry his uh, food, provisions, rations, uh, however small they may be, and also uh, other little things he might need, a comb, uh, his pocket knife, uh, maybe even a fire starting kit, something like that. So you've got a haversack for those kind of things and of course every soldier needs a, a canteen to carry water on the field. This is a simple uh, wooden canteen. A tin canteen would work also, but uh, this is a great uh, outfit here for a militiaman. He only needs a couple more things, and then he's ready to go out onto the field. He'll need a cartridge box and a musket. The items we showed you today are a very generic outfit for a militia soldier. If you're going to join a specific unit, you need to contact your unit commander to find out what they recommend. Well, that's just kind of a, a peek at what typical militia garb would look like. Um, otherwise, I hope you learned a great deal about militias and specifically about the major role that volunteers had in securing our country's independence during the American Revolution. See you next time.